Good morning, folks. We are in uh, the book of Ephesians today. I mentioned earlier to the folks in Sunday school that the um, this is the time of year usually. I don't think I did this last year, but I usually this time of year try to teach or preach uh, a short series of messages uh, concerning one particular topic that we all understand and know about, and that's called the family. And I try to um, try to incorporate teaching on the family all year long as it comes up, but this is a time that I set aside just for that. And I'll teach two, three, maybe four lessons or sermons on this topic. And um, uh, this one is uh, where we'll start today in that in that area. We're going to start in Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians 5 and 6 is just one of the places in the Bible we talk, we see some very uh, direct, intentional teaching from God to Christians about family and family relationships. And we're going to call this uh, unity in our house. Unity in our house. Uh, Every message will be about unity in the home in our house and but today we're going to be uh, specifically dealing with a spirit-filled wife spirit-filled wife and you'll see why i call it that in just a minute Uh, we will begin uh, with this text we're going to the text says verses 22 through 24 but we're actually going to back up a little bit we're going to read a few verses earlier because that will set the groundwork um, so let's, let's just read the text. This is a familiar text. Almost everybody in this room has heard it uh, taught or preached or read it sometime or another in your lifetime. So it's not anything new for any of us. But um, this, this text in Ephesians 5 and chapter 6 as well is one of the clearest teachings on family. And uh, nowadays, nowadays, and not just in our day that we're living right now, but for the for many years before us, the family, the the people call it the nuclear family. I call it the biblical family. Um, but the family institution and the structure of the family has been just disrupted and messed up so bad uh, in the days that we live in. But it's been going on for a long, long time. As a matter of fact, it started back in the Garden of Eden. And Satan tried to destroy the family. As soon as God set up marriage and God set up the family, Satan tried to destroy it. And Adam and Eve got kicked out of their house uh, because of their disobedience to God. Uh, Adam and Eve's first sons, one killed the other. The family just started falling apart because of Satan's attack. And it's still been going on. It's still going on today. It's, it's worse now than ever uh, because things just get worse and worse and worse. But the closer we get to the rapture of the church, the closer we get to the Lord coming back, and the closer we get to the tribulation period and Satan coming and setting up his kingdom on the earth for seven years, the closer we get to all those events happening, the worse it is going to get. I know I say that a lot, but I do it intentionally because I believe the scripture points that way and shows us that things are getting worse and worse for a reason, not just because people are worse. All right, we're just as... We're just as sinful today as they were in Adam's day, Adam and Eve's day, and, and there's no difference. That sinful nature is still there. But the attack today is more open than it's ever been. And uh, the Bible tells us that, I wish I'd looked this up, but I didn't look for the reference. The Bible tells us in the New Testament that uh, there will be a day when men will say evil is good and good is evil. We're living in that day, folks. Very clearly, we're living in that day. And uh, we need to be aware of that and be aware of the the very real and very uh, deadly attacks on marriage, on family, on the whole institution that's involved, the whole relationships. And that's what we're going to deal with. Um, uh, I was just talking to somebody this week, a Christian couple, they don't come to this church, never been here. But they were telling me something that 
that surprised me because I thought I was the one that just thought this and I didn't think it was that widespread. They're not from this area. They're from further north, up, uh, near the Canadian border, up that direction. And this couple told me, they said, you know, until we moved here and got in a good church, we had never heard any kind of teaching on family or marriage. And of course, like most of us, uh, or at least it depended on your home life when you were growing up, they were never taught the principles of marriage and love and respect and all of that. They were never taught those things at home. It's just expected that the kids will learn it, you know, and you just don't teach it intentionally. And they said, we, we were never really taught those things. And our marriage was always up and down, up and down, just you know, battling and all this stuff and never getting along, never unity in our house. And they said, but we finally found a good church and we both got saved and we started learning about the family because the church taught a lot about family. And for the first time, after being married for many years, for the first time we started realizing that the family can work. The family can be a, pay, a place of unity and peace. And it doesn't have to be a war zone all the time and a contest of authority and all that. It, it can be a place of, of great peace and joy. And so we, and, and I watched that husband and wife look at each other and I thought to myself, yeah, they've got it figured out. They've got it. Because you can tell, can't you? And uh, I was really, really amazed to hear them talk so openly about that and what a difference the Bible has made in their lives. And uh, I say they don't come to church here. I wish they did, but that's okay. We are here, and we're the ones that God's wanting to teach us about. And God laid this on my heart over a month ago, and I was just waiting until the right time, as I tell you that often, but that really is how it works, <laughs> okay? And I'm not making these things up. As a, as a pastor, I, I wait until God gives me the green light, and then uh, I teach it. So none of this was picked out for you because you're here today or it wasn't picked because, uh, to preach today because somebody's not here. It was picked because this is when God said do it and that's why we're going to do it. So I hope that everybody here will learn something because the message says the spirit-filled wife because that's where God starts, okay? Uh, in this, the order of things, God starts teaching us uh, about the wife first in this family relationship. But um, that's not where we'll stop. That's where we'll start. Because the wife is not the only person in the family, is she? The mom's not the only one. The lady of the house is not the only one that matters. She's not the one who can fix everything and make everything else go, all the problems go away. Even though that's the role that most women perform is trying to fix everything for everybody. But that's not what God intended. So we're not going to just, we're going to start with the wife today, the lady of the house, and we're going to move on to the husband next week, and we're going to move to the children after that, and we're even going to deal with servants after that, because servants are mentioned as well, and uh, that's, that today that is, equates to employees, people who work jobs and associate with others and work relationships, and we're going to deal with all that. I started to call it the one about uh, employees and work, Brother Jerry. I started to call that a unity in the workhouse. But <laughs> I, I thought, no, nah, just keep it the way it is. <laughs> workhouse, we know what that used to mean, right? You know, that's where you got sent when you did something wrong and you got arrested and you sent them to the workhouse. But anyway, <laughs> oh, goodness. All right. Ephesians chapter 5. Let's read the text I've got marked up here, and then we're going to back up and read some extra. Starting at verse 22. Uh, read, uh, read, read along silently while I read it out loud, please. Uh, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, uh, oh, that's for the husbands, I'm sorry. <laughs> I want to get to the husbands today, I really do. But anyway, that's next week. Even though we're going to be drawing out some things of other texts, so don't, don't feel like we're just going to talk about that. 
But we do need to deal with the wives. And, and I know in, in years of preaching, over 40 years or whatever it is, I can't remember now of preaching, um, this year is 40 years. Yeah, how about that? Uh, anyway, yeah, 1984. Okay. I'm trying to remember. I, I didn't realize what year it was. Okay, but anyway, in the years of preaching, uh, we've we I've seen as a preacher myself. I've seen dealing with family issues and from the Bible. The easiest of all of these is dealing with the wife. <laughs> the easiest. It gets real hairy and and nitty gritty when you start dealing with the men. <laughs> Now, I'm thankful men in this church are not that way, okay? Uh, it's, I don't have a problem with... The men in our church are very uh, submissive to God's Word and willing to listen and ready to be taught, you know. And uh, Miss JJ, I see that mischievous look on your face. Don't you do it. Brother Steve, I know you're listening back there. Miss JJ is not saying anything bad about you, Okay. And he's out there at the front door watching the parking lot. But I know <laughs> Miss JJ's sitting there with that mischievous look on her face. Okay. All right. Would you back up with me, please, to verse 21? Verse 21. Verse 21 says, Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of the Lord. So the verse before dealing with the wives talks to everybody. And the word submit is mentioned. Submission is mentioned. And uh, these, this is a very important thing that we understand uh, before we go any further. And we are, I'm going to spend a lot of time in this message just defining submission. What it's not and what it is. Because a lot of people get the wrong idea. One day... I was at work, brother. And there's this so-called preacher who visits where I work. I've told you about him one time before. He is not a friend of mine. He's a scoundrel. He's a liar. Uh, he's a cheat. He's all those things that you don't think of in a preacher or a Christian of any kind. And uh, I just, I try to be nice to him. But I don't count him as a friend. I, I'm that close to counting him as an enemy. Because he's an enemy to God's word. He misuses scripture. And I won't tell you all the things that I've seen him do. And I've seen it with my own eyes. And I've heard it with my own ears. From his own mouth. But one day. The last time I dealt with him. He said. Um, he was talking about. Oh. Well I can't tell the details. But he was talking about a lady who was in a position of authority and he was ranting at her for being in a position of authority. And he said, God says, his words, God says, you need to be at home washing dishes and washing clothes and taking care of your kids. You have no business being in a position of authority. That's what he said. Now, Folks, my blood started just boiling. Because, number one, he took Scripture out of context. Now, that makes me mad to see anybody take the Bible and twist it to make it say what he wanted. The Bible doesn't say that at all. Okay? But he took, he, he took Scripture that was intended for church and marriage relationships inside the church, and he applied it to a workplace to something it has nothing to do with. And, uh, and I've had a few words with him. Cause that doesn't, I don't, I can't, I'm not going to keep my mouth shut when somebody does something like that. If I'm in a position where I can talk, I'm going to talk. <laughs> and it gave me a chance to preach a little bit. And uh, that's the last time he's talked to me. <laughs> last time I've had to speak with him. I'd like to sit down with him and, and help him see the truth, but he refuses to see the truth. But a lot of people will take scripture, especially about family, and twist it to say something it doesn't say. The lost world today 
will take things they have heard about Christianity or about Bible-believing people and about Christian homes, and they take those things and they misapply them or they don't understand them and they twist them around to say what they think they say. And what we're going to do today is just see what it says. And we're going to read it clearly because notice I used the word spirit-filled. See that? Look at verse 18. Verse 18. Verse 18 says, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess. Okay? You notice the semicolon. There's not a change of subject. The next phrase is, comp is connected to the first phrase. But it's also, uh, it is a comparison. I guess I can, I have the freedom to say it that way. It, there is a comparison of the first thought and the second thought. They are connected in some way. They're not the same, but they're connected. He's making a comparison. And he says, the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess. We know what that means, right? Everybody knows what that means. Okay, don't have to draw any pictures. Don't have to show you any drunk people in pictures. Nothing like that, right? Everybody understands. But... Notice the word but. Remember this morning in Sunday school, I said, every time God uses the word but, you ought to pay close attention. Well, God put the word but right here, and he said, but be filled with what? Spirit. The Spirit. Do you have a Bible that has the word Spirit capitalized? Is the, word, is the S capitalized in your, word, in your Bible? Yes. Why is that? Because it's a proper noun. The Spirit, the Spirit of God. It's talking about the Holy Spirit. That's why he's capitalized. The translators of the English Bible who did the King James Bible, when they translated the word for spirit and they knew it was connected with the Spirit of God, they always capitalized the word so that we would recognize it in English as being the Spirit of God. You'll see the word spirit written in other places where it's just a small s, so it doesn't really mean the Spirit of God. Okay? Be filled with the Spirit. Now, be filled with the Spirit is a very important biblical teaching that we need to understand. And I'm going to spend some time here, okay? Um, I should have done this first. I've got myself backwards here, okay? I want to show you a couple of things. Um, the book of Ephesians, chapters 5 and 6, give us three things. And I, I should have put this the first thing, and I now I'm behind. I'm all mixed up and backwards. But it's okay. I'm going to show it to you anyway. Three things that are mentioned in chapters 5 and 6 concerning unity. Unity in God's house. Unity in God's house. Actually, uh, it's not just chapter 5, verse 18 that talks about that. But that's, that's the way it can be accomplished, is being filled with the Spirit. Christians need to be filled with the Spirit. Well, I'll give you a definition of that in just a minute. I'll give you several, actually. Unity in our house, that's talking about our homes and our families, is what we're going to study today. And now, well, not just today, we're going to start today, and it's going to take us three weeks. Today, next week, and the week after to cover the house. And then unity at work is the last one that I told you about, the workhouse, okay? But uh, that's, that's the last one, the last section of this study. Um, I didn't deal with the unity in God's house because I teach that quite often in our church, how we ought to get along with each other, and the way we do that is by allowing God to lead us so we don't think about self all the time, get our eyes off self, get our eyes on the Lord, and then we won't be picking at each other and gossiping about each other and, and causing trouble for each other and all that. We'll have unity in God's house. But unity in our house is what we're dealing with now. All right, let's go. This doctrine, this teaching today, is only possible in the life, marriage, family, home, whatever context you want to put it in, it's only possible in people who are saved, which the first three chapters of Ephesians, chapters 1, 2, and 3, teach about being in Christ. In Christ is a, a phrase that's used over and over and over in the first three chapters. And it's talking about people who have accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior, and they come to God and say, God, will you forgive my sins and make me your child because of what Jesus did for me? And they are in Christ now. 
Okay? Actually, the Bible describes it as Christ being in you. Okay? But then, the second uh, way that a person can, this, is, this unity in our house is possible, is that a, a Christian is spirit-filled. All right? Like verse 18 talks about. Now, when, when a Baptist preacher says, be filled with the Spirit, it has a different meaning than it does when a whole bunch of other folks say, be filled with the Spirit. And some of you know what I'm talking about. Because there's a whole lot of false teaching about being filled with the Spirit of God. A whole lot of false teaching about it. Filled with the Spirit is not a... Uh, ooh, or it's not a Shambhala! I'm being silly because that's it's. I have no respect for it. Okay, it's not that kind of stuff. And you know, I think you understand what I'm doing, right? When I do that, it's not that kind of of experience. Being filled with the Spirit has to do with each individual person. And your relationship to God, and I'm going to show you, I'm going to spend a lot of time this morning on just this part, being filled with the Spirit. Let me give you a couple of different definitions. I've got probably a half a dozen definitions that I took from dictionaries, encyclopedias, other preachers, and I finally just narrowed it down to two that are simple enough for me to understand. And that's what I'm going to show you, okay? Being filled with the Spirit is, first you have to be saved, Okay? If you're saved, if you're a born-again Christian, if you're God's child, if your name's written in the book of life in heaven, all those, however way you want to describe it, if you're saved, then the Spirit of God already dwells in you. He lives there. Okay? That's why you're guaranteed to go to heaven because he will be, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, he has sealed you and he will guarantee that you'll get to heaven. But that's not the same thing as being filled with the Spirit. The Bible talks about being filled in several different ways. One, it's not having more of the Holy Spirit. It means the Holy Spirit, or God, has more of you. You are surrendered more to him in your life. That's when you are filled with the Spirit. It means simply that you're, will, you're willing to be guided by God and you're accepting whatever it is he wants you to do and you're doing it. That's being filled with spirit. It also means submission to God, uh, his word, his way, his spirit, and being, is being filled with the spirit. Now those, that second one is a definition uh, that I took from another fellow and I made it my own. And the first one is the one that I came up with that God gave me years ago that I just feel like those are simple enough. Everybody can grasp it and everybody can understand it. But to do it, that's the hard part. But this is the key. This is the key to this whole message. That we're submitted, yielded to God. A wife, in order to be a good wife, in order to be a, a, a good lady of the house, in order to be the queen of her home, and to do it right, she needs to be filled with the Spirit of God. She needs to be yielded to God. She needs to be submitted to God and whatever His will is for her life. It's the only way you can do it. Hey, ladies, women already have a rough enough life. They already have difficulties in life that men would say, Whoa, oh, I'm not going through that. No way. Okay? And I know men have their own difficulties too. And most women say, that's nothing. <laughs> they just don't know, do they, Brother Jerry? They just don't know. Do they, Brother do they know? No way. That's what we're going to tell them anyway. <laughs> but seriously, being serious, life for a woman is already difficult. But add to that a man. Okay? <laughs> add to that a man who first thinks he knows everything, second doesn't know everything, <laughs> Third, no, we won't go to the third. Anyway, there's a whole bunch of numbers, more than I can count. I know, because it takes one to know one. I'm one too. But you add to that a man, and it, 
it complicates life tremendously. Okay? And it does for the man, too. I mean, add the woman to his life, it complicates. But anyway, that's the way God intended it. And by the way, if a man adds another man to his life, that's not complicated, that's wicked. That's right. Okay? And if a woman adds a woman to her life as her mate, well, folks, that's not, that's not complicated. That's just from the devil. All right. This establishment of the home and the family, um, God established in the Garden of Eden, and God has reestablished that or re, re, reaffirmed that over and over and over and over and over and over and over in Scripture. Over and over, Jesus taught it, the apostles taught it, the Bible teaches it all the way to the end of Revelation, and we see this one man, one woman. That's right. Yeah. yeah. One man, one woman. And not, not any other combination. That's marriage. That's family. That's how a family starts. All right. Now these are. Th I know I'm preaching to the choir. You folks know all this already. Even if even if you know it and you're afraid to say it. Okay. You know it, but you don't feel the freedom to say it. There's a lot of places we go or places we are. We we feel like we can't say those things out loud. Um, if Christians and believers in the Bible don't say it, who's going to? Amen. So, let's do our best now to quickly, as quickly as I can, and if I don't finish this, then the men will just have to hear part of the wife's sermon next week, and we'll just continue on until we finish it, okay? I don't want you to think I'm going to keep going until I finish. If time gets away, I'll stop. We see in verses 21 and 22 the exhortation. Do you remember to exhort someone? To exhort someone is not to tell them what to do, but it's to, to encourage them to do right and then help them to do it. All right? God gives the instructions. In uh, verses, verse 21, we saw we submit ourselves one to another in the, fear of the, in the fear of God. Notice the in the fear of God is included in that. But notice verse 22. God speaks directly to the ladies. God speaks directly to the ladies. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. We are going into great detail in this teaching to take each little part of every verse. Because I don't want to leave any stone unturned. I don't want to leave any uh, misconceptions or crazy ideas. I don't want to leave that in anybody's mind. Um, because this is a touchy subject. I know it is. I dealt with it for a long time. And, and Miss Glenda, I'm going to use my dear wife as an example, and I, w I don't want to embarrass you. I remember the stage in our marriage when Miss Glenda exhibited and showed in a, a very real way her desire to be a submissive wife. But I never said anything back because I didn't know. I was ignorant. We hadn't been taught these things growing up, and we didn't know. It didn't just come natural. It doesn't come natural. And I, we didn't understand biblical principles about marriage in our early days. But I remember when my wife started exhibiting that she started showing me that God was dealing with her long before I learned it. Long before I knew how to be a good husband, she was striving to be a good wife. And that's what God used to open my eyes and start teaching me. Of course, I learned a lot slower. She learns a lot faster than I do. Isn't that true, ladies, most of the time? You don't have, don't be nice, don't be nice. But it's true, it's true. And that's okay, fellas, it's okay. We, we learn a little slower, and it's okay if they get ahead of us. It's just fine. That's not putting us down. That just means we want to see if it works for them first. <laughs> All right? So we let them go. Let them do it. Definition of submission. Okay? The definition of submission. First, I'm going to show you what submission is not. All right? Submission is not subjugation. Uh, subjugation, let me read you a, a dictionary definition. The act of subduing and bringing under the power or absolute control of another. Okay? Subjugation. 
Um, that is not Bible submission. Not even close. Okay? That's why I chose the word subjugation uh, because in the Bible, a wife can, may, and does appeal to her husband in any situation. Okay? She is not just allowed to think, she's encouraged to think. That's, what, that's God's plan. Two people. Not one person and one person, but two people. Equal. Side by side. So it's not subjugation because a wife can and should appeal to her husband. She can have her own thoughts. She ought to have her own thoughts. She ought to have her own opinions. She ought to have her own ideas. And she ought to share them with her husband and a good husband will listen to her. Amen? That's just a little footnote added at the end. But submission is not subjugation. Submission is not, and I, this is obvious, but I'm going to say it anyway, it's not slavery. You say, well, I wouldn't have thought that. Huh, you'd be surprised how many men think it is. You'd be surprised. Dealing with couples and marriage people over the years, folks, I am surprised how many Christian men get the wrong idea because they don't read all of Scripture. They only read the part they want to read. Or they listen to the preacher they want to hear who talks about it. It's not slavery. A wife is not, a, a wife is her husband's equal. One's not better than the other. One's not higher than the other. Husband and wife are equal. On equal, equal standing. Even ground. Okay? They're both equal. In God's eyes, God sees each as an individual and each the same value, the same standing, but just different positions, different roles of life. That's all. All right? Uh, a counterpart, uh, wife and husband are to respect each other, but let's talk about just the wife today. The wife is to be respected. She is to be cherished. She is to be adored by her husband. Not by everybody else's husband. Okay? we got to make sure we put that in today. Very important. She is not his slave. She is not his servant. She is not his piece of property. She's not a doormat. I heard of a husband. A guy called himself a Christian. And in the early years of his marriage, he made it a point. Now this is disgusting, but he made it a point to think of things he could Tell his wife she has to do just to make it hard for her to test her submission to him as to him as her husband. And he he just all the time was coming up with things to tell her she needed to do as his wife to just test her. And then when she didn't want to do something, he would rant and rave and scream and, and abuse her. He called himself a Christian. There's nothing Christ like about that. No. Nothing. I can, there's another source for that that's from the devil that's from hell it's from sin a sinful source submission is not about equality okay as I said a minute ago it's not about equality it, it's, uh, it's all about God's order God's order in the family that's all it's about it's not about equality we are to submit to authority in life but it doesn't mean somebody who has authority over you is better than you or more valuable than you, or smarter than you. All right? So it's, it's not about equality. It's simply about authority. That's all. Because somebody has to lead. Listen, as a pastor of a church, I have no authority over you. No authority. God does. But a, a pastor, and this, I'm just using this illustration, a pastor is a servant leader. A servant leader. I serve the church. I serve the Lord. That's what should be my goals in life. But as the leader of the church, I'm, I do it as servant. Folks, a good husband, I know, it's next week or whenever, but a good husband is a servant leader. Amen? A servant leader. 
a leader who is leading by serving. Okay? It's very important. Um, wait just a minute. Remember the Trinity of God? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit? Uh, did you know that there is submission in the Trinity? God the Son is submissive to the Father. Even though they're equal. They're the same. They're equal. There's no difference in them. But God sets up authority. Even in the Trinity. The Spirit of God is subject to the Father. But they're equal. So is one less God than the other? No. Nope. They're the same. But God establishes a chain of authority. It's, it gives good order to things. What is it they say? Um, I won't ask you if this has ever happened to you, but I will use it as an example just because you will relate to this. Everybody knows about this. If, uh, and I know, no, I know of no one in this room that this has happened to, so that's why I feel free to use this. But if it has, it's not because I know, because I don't. For example, you take a, a, a fella, a young guy, and he, he grows up, sort of, and he gets married to this lady. And this, he and this lady are married to each other. They love each other, and everything's gone hunky-dory. And guess what? They move into Mama's house, and they live with Mama. And now, all of a sudden, you've got husband, son, who has two heads, but... I know that doesn't. I know that's not scriptural, but you understand what I mean. You've got a house that has two heads in it, yeah. and our preacher used to say, uh, "A house with two heads is a two-headed monster." <laughs> now, I'm not criticizing mamas or mother-in-laws, or I'm not. That's not my purpose. I'm just saying a house can just have one queen and one king. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, because if, there's, if there are two queens or there are two kings, there's going to be conflict. No matter how hard you try, no matter how well you get along, there's always sometime going to be some conflict. There, it's just natural. It's going to happen. So that's why God said that the husband is to leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife. Okay, that's the structure. That's the way it works. Now, um, we should not be surprised, and I hope you're not surprised, that natural man, and I'm talking about people who are not saved, who don't know the Bible, don't have any respect for God's word, do not understand this concept of the Christian home or uh, a male and female home, husband and wife home. They don't understand that. That's why it's perverted. Now, submission. What is submission? Submission, we use the word submit, is given to us. Look at chapter 5, verse 21. Submitting yourselves one to another. In the fear of God. Submitting. Uh, the, um, let me give you some other places in the Bible. I'm just going to read it real quick and keep going. You can write it down if you want to, okay? In Luke chapter 2, verse 51, we see that, that Jesus was subject unto his parents. He was subject to his parents, okay? Nothing wrong with that. That was a good thing. He was subject to his parents. Romans chapter 13, verse 1. We are, as Christians, we are commanded by God to be subject, to be subject to higher authorities in, in this world, civil authorities, governments and people like that. We're to subject ourselves and, uh, and submit ourselves to their leadership. Let them lead us. All right? And, and I understand Romans chapter 13 is a controversial place in the Bible for people who don't, want, don't like government authority. And I'm pretty close to right there with you. <laughs> But as long as the government doesn't go against God's word, we're commanded by God to obey that government. Okay? And we're going to talk about that in a minute. That we, uh, we do draw the line when, it, when it, the, any authority says do something that's against God's word, then you must refuse. And you have that obligation. If you want to be right with God, you disobey the authority and you obey God. And it's, there are illustrations of that in Scripture. And that applies to husbands and wives, too. It really does. So, um, to be under, is it this, this Scripture, this, the words that are translated uh, submit, 
uh, are also translated in other ways. And I'm just going to give you the references real quick. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 34, uh, to be under obedience is the same word that's translated submit in the Greek. It, it's translated to be under obedience in 1 Corinthians 14. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 27, the same word is translated submit over here in Ephesians. It's translated under, to be under authority, okay? Uh, the same word is translated submit over in Ephesians is in Titus chapter 2, verse 5, is translated the word obedient, obedient. So it depends on the context. There's a relationship between all of these words. But to be under authority, to be under uh, the rule of somebody else, to be under uh, the, the leadership of somebody else uh, is not a bad thing. It does not mean um, that anything bad, it's, in the, it's not a sense of being inferior wives, it's not a sense of being inferior to him, no, but it's in the sense of being under his leadership, allowing him to lead, that's all. Let him take responsibility. Let him answer to God for the family. Uh, that's, that's basically uh, what we're talking about here. It has to do with leadership. Leadership. Uh, I know a preacher who said that, I heard him say that his grandmother was a dear Christian lady. And she was by no means, uh, um, I'm trying to think of a nice word, mousy. She was not a lady to just sit around and, you know, like this and never talk. No, she was outspoken. She was very forward with her opinion. And she was a very uh, gracious, kind-hearted, sweet lady. But she always said that, uh, and I, I, I never knew her, but I heard the preacher talking about his grandma, and I thought, hmm, that sounds nice. He said that she always said, I'm so thankful God gave me a good head She's talking about her husband. Mm -hmm. God gave me a good head. Because he's such a warm, kind, gentle man. And she went on to sing the praises of her husband. Now, folks, that, that means a lot. It really does. Because it's an, it's a, I always thought it was enough for a woman to give up her name and take her husband's name. That's a big thing. You give up your identity and you become identified with him. That's a big thing. And I always thought it was quite a sacrifice for a lady to give up her family and go. And now that she has a new family, you don't give them up totally. I understand that. But you know what I mean. You adopt this family. This is your husband. And you're this, then now you're a family. And this family comes first. And you can't put the other family above this one and all that. And it gets complicated. I know. I know. Everybody has family and we all have to deal with that. But there are lots of things you have to balance. But to, but to then, on top of that, for a lady to say, okay, I'm not going to lead. I'm going to let you lead. If we have a difference of opinion and we discuss it and we can't come together and make the same, we can't agree on this issue, this decision, then you make the final decision. And then in the, in the back of her mind, she's saying, because if, if it's wrong, it's your fault, buddy. It's not mine. <laughs> right? And that's a good thing. Because if this decision has something to do with following God, obeying God, then let God deal with him. But if, if the lady says, no, 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 you're wrong. You don't know what you're doing. We're going to do it my way. Then that, and her way may be the right way. It may be the right way. Yes. But that's not the right way to handle it. Because now she stepped into his position and now she's going to answer to God. Yes. And God says, huh, well, I was going to deal with him, but now I have to deal with you because you're out of your place. Right. You see, we all have a place, don't we? We all have a, a role to play in life, and especially in the family. Mm -hmm. now, um, there's a lot to this, isn't there? Mm -hmm. It's a lot more complicated than I'm talking about. That's why this is going very deep a little later. Okay? Not today, because we're not going to have time. I already see that. Let's keep going. The, um, 
Oh, I got ahead of myself back there, didn't I? Yeah. The decision of submission is very important. I want you to notice verse 22. It says, wives, submit what? Yourselves. Yourselves. Does that verse say, husbands, make your wife submit? No. Does it say anything about somebody else saying, tell that woman to be submissive to her husband? No. no. It's, God speaks directly to the wife and he says, wives, submit yourselves. Submit yourselves. It's a decision that is made by the woman herself. You, you submit yourself. Submission is voluntary. It's a matter of obedience to God, yes. But it's, God doesn't force anybody to do it. Does God force anybody to do anything? No. He, lives, he leaves us all as, uh, uh, I've forgotten the phrase. Um, we each have the freedom to choose. I, was trying, I can't remember the name of it, but anyway, I'll think of it in a minute. We each have liberty to choose. God gives us that as a gift but he allows us to make the right choice and the wrong ones. Each of us have to answer for that. So we're all accountable. And he gives the wife the choice, but he tells her. The instruction is, wife, submit yourself. You submit. You be willing to do that. It's not something your husband forces you to do. Listen, forced submission is not submission, is it? No. That's that subjugation we talked about. Yeah. Submission is something we decide to do. I mean... Everybody's submitted, submissive to somebody. Yes. Everybody's supposed to be submitted to God, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That's why he said, in verse 21, submitting yourselves one to another. We're all to be submissive. But, ladies, can I, I want to set your mind at ease here. The direction of submission, these are just an outline. It doesn't mean a whole lot. Just a way of making an outline to teach it. Is unto your own husband's. Remember I told you about that fellow at Forestry where I work who uh, came in there and said women have no place of authority and all that stuff. You know why? He wants every woman to submit to his words. Okay? The wife, the woman he was talking about, was not submissive to him. She has no reason to submit to him. He has no authority in her life. He's not part of the family he's not part of the organization he's not a boss nothing but some men go around with the attitude that every woman is to obey what he says that's not how it works is it no no and in the home the wife is to be willing to submit to her husband's leadership let him lead okay lead and what is a leader one who goes first right the leader is not behind with a whip saying get out there do that Ha! That's not a leader. That's a driver. The leader is one who steps out and takes the first step and goes first and say, come with me. That's a leader. That's a leader. And it's, I believe it's a biblical leader in the home. I believe that's what husbands are supposed to do. But we'll talk about that next time. All right? But the Bible says specifically to your own husband, to nobody else's, not to all men, but to your own husband, that's it. That's all. In the, in the marriage relationship, in the home, that's the only point of submission is to your own husband. That's it. Um, hmm. Let's keep going. We're going to do this real quick here, and then we're going to stop. I'm doing these because these are short. Because I'm not even to point two yet, but I'm still doing my sub points like I like to do, Brother Jerry. Because they're short. They're little things. The motive to submit. Look at the verse. I told you we're taking these verses apart a little at a time. You see what I mean? Verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. As unto the Lord. I believe scriptural, biblical, Bible-based submission is an attitude that we take because we want to be right with God. We submit as unto the Lord. Um, 
We all are commanded by God to be submissive to some authorities. Now listen carefully now. And I'm, I'm going to stop. i got one more point and then I'm going to stop right here. No, that's the last one. That's the last one for today. The reason, the motive for our submission, and that's whether it's a wife to her husband or any other submission we do in this life, is so that we are a testimony to the, everybody else, testimony to the one we submit under, some ones who view us, the ones who watch us in life, what it is, but mainly to God, is we are doing this as unto the Lord. Can I talk about my job just for a second? It's a good illustration. And I'll use myself instead of you this time. Uh, and my job, as it is with everybody else, there are things that I'm told to do by my authorities that I may not agree with or I think is a silly idea or it doesn't make sense or something else is more important. Okay, I'm, I don't agree with the decision, but I've been told to do it. Now, as a Christian, as a child of God, I could say, now, wait a minute, that's ridiculous. Why should I do that when this over here needs to be done first? Right? Just an example. Would that be a good testimony for me with my authority? No. 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 It would. Because my authority, my boss, has authority over me. Okay? And she has the right and the job to tell me what to do. And I have the job to do what she says. Right? Yeah. Now, but if I do this job as unto the Lord which is the way we do everything in this life. Not just marriage, but everything. As unto the Lord, then I will submit to her leadership. Now, my boss is a lady. I'll submit to that leadership because I do it as unto the Lord. I want to have a good testimony as a Christian. It has nothing to, do with being, nothing to do with being a preacher. It's just a child of God. As a Christian, I want to have a testimony. I want people to see that I have a submissive spirit. I'm willing to obey when somebody has authority to tell me what to do. I'm willing to do it. As long as it doesn't go against the Bible, that's what my responsibility is, to obey. And I want to have a good, I want to have a good testimony with those around me that I'm a submissive employee, for example. I will do what I'm told. And I don't argue. I don't back talk. I don't uh, throw a fit. I just say, yes, ma'am. And I do my job. All right? Whether I agree with it or not, I'll do it. Now, what if what I'm doing is not important? And the other thing over there that I thought was most important, I should have done. And turns out, I was right. All right? In the end, turns out I was right. That job didn't get done, and the boss got in trouble for it. Because that job wasn't done, and I was doing what the boss told me to do. Who's going to answer for it, for that problem? The boss is. Not me. I'm just doing what I was told. Right? But what if I'd said, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to do what I think is most important. Mm -hmm. I'm the one that's going to answer for it. I stepped out of my position, didn't I? You see what I mean? This, this thing of submission works in every part of life. And you do it as unto the Lord. It's a good principle to live by, folks. You do it as unto the Lord. Even if you don't agree with it, even if you don't like it, you do it because it's right with God to do it. Whatever position you're in in life, whatever role you play, whatever part of society you are, whatever part of the family you are, you take your position and you do it and you stay in that position because that's where God put you. That's where God put me. All right? We may, not, we may not always be happy with that place or that position, but we should do it as unto the Lord. Everything you do in life, make sure it is as unto the Lord. I'm going to do this because it's the right thing to do according to what God has put me in this life to do. So I'm going to do that, even though I don't agree. I guarantee you, and I'm, I don't have to guarantee, I know my wife has gone along or agreed with me or allowed me to make decisions in life when I was wrong many, many times. Many, Miss Barbara. More times than I can count. I couldn't make a list long enough 
to feel all the bad decisions I've made in our marriage, in our lives. I couldn't, there's no way. I've made a bunch of them. And my dear wife, a lot of times, has known that it was a bad decision. But instead of, sometimes she would, if she felt like it was something that was really important and was gonna cost us or was gonna be a big problem or you know something like that, she'll say, honey, why don't you think about this? Or wait just a minute, I'm not so sure I agree with that. Or I don't think that's the right thing to do. Or she'll just come right out and say, you're just wrong. You need, you, we don't need to do it that way. We need to do it this way. Now that's a pretty extreme situation. She would only do that if really it was necessary. Because that would get my attention real quick. I'd say, ooh, well, it's that serious. Because yeah, I know her, and I know if she says that, I better wait a second now. That, there is something wrong. But if she says, well, what, will you think about this option? I do. I think about it. And I weigh it, and I see if she's right. But sometimes, you know, if it, Miss, Miss JJ, if it has to do with uh, the choice of whether to uh, buy extra groceries or buy a shotgun, you know, I've got to, I've got to decide which one of those is the most important. You know, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Say, listen, folks. Sometimes you just got to do what's most important, and you buy the shotgun. Right? <laughs> but. Even though the wife, even though the wife thinks that's not the best option to use for that limited amount of money, she knows, but she just doesn't know everything. I do. I'm going to do it anyway, right? I, yeah. Everybody here can relate to that, right? We all we all know what that's like. Yeah. Amen. You can get food with a shotgun. That's right. And it never loses value, does it? That's right. Everything that goes bang gains in value if you take care of it. It doesn't lose value. So it's a good investment. So, see, my, my reasoning works. Oh, no. I know. It may be at the right time and situation. But anyway, you see the point. I know I'm talking around, around and around and around just beating this thing up. But, folks, it, it's something we got to get hold of. It's something we really need to apply to our lives. As unto the Lord, every decision, everything you do, make sure it's as unto the Lord. You're doing it because you want to please the Lord, not because you agree or you think it's the best way, but you know that you want to be right with God. Okay? And make sure that you try to live that way. All right. We will pick up next time with more of this because we're not going to, we won't get to the men next week, but we'll probably say something about them anyway since it's Father's Day. We will talk about the men anyway. All right. And listen, around here, around here, uh, Mother's Day and Father's Day, those days, have nothing to do with whether you have children or whether you have a, a dozen children or whether you have whether you're a, a, a husband or a still single kid uh, if male or female that's all we look at okay we don't care about who's got kids and who doesn't have kids and who's married and who's not when I, when we teach these things it applies to everybody see there's principles in here that apply to every person so there's something here for everybody, even though the topic says it's just for the wife. There's something here for all of us. So try to learn and let God teach us of what we need to know. Let's pray. Dear Father, we are so thankful. I'm thankful as a pastor for these dear folks, these people sitting here listening to me. And I, I realize, Lord, I know that I ramble and, and I, I take much longer than necessary and all of that. But I'm so thankful for people uh, who are willing to listen and wanting to learn from your word, not from the preacher, but from your word. So, Lord, help us to be careful to use this life that we have, each of us, this short life we're given, to use every day of it, every moment of it, in a way that honors you and pleases you. Dear Father, I pray that if there's anyone in our midst today who is not saved not certain of going to heaven when death comes that at this moment as the Holy Spirit convicts and works in each heart I just pray that each of us will examine ourselves and make sure that we're saved and if we're not if there's anybody not saved today in this room please work in their hearts that they'll see that coming to you through Jesus and asking you for forgiveness of sin 
simply because Jesus paid for those sins by dying on the cross is all we need to do. Give our lives to you by, by coming to you for that reason and give you the life we have left and trust you to lead us to live for you. Pray that each of us will seek your will and follow you right now in whatever way you guide us to do that. Help our homes and our families, our individuals, to be strong in you, to have strong faith, to trust in you. Even during adversity and problems and trials and difficulties, that we would each seek to listen to you and obey your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Dear folks, this, you okay?